Hi, I'm Cody, and today is all about ferro resonance. What it is, where it comes from, and how do we protect ourselves against it? Let's get into it. All right, so here we are. Here's the typical ferro resonance situation that we all run into. We've got three individual cutouts feeding some underground primary cable, and those are feeding a pad mount three-phase transformer with a delta high side. And what happens is typically we're going to close in one cutout, right? So we come hot on one cutout, it goes down, hits our delta high side, and comes back to us hot, right, on the bottom side of these cutouts. So when we close in B phase, this one's going to blow up. That's ferro. And to better understand why the heck that happens, we first have to explore the question or really just review the question, is why doesn't a transformer blow up in the first place, meaning like a single phase transformer? So let's dive into that. Okay, so here we have just a transformer coil, right? So it is not wrapped around a core, it's just hanging out there, just essentially just an insulated piece of wire. And we know that if we throw a phase to phase or phase to neutral across this coil, it's gonna blow up, right? Well, why the heck is it going to blow up? Well, the reason is because the only thing opposing the current flow is the very, very small amount of resistance that this wire is going to have. Now, if we take that same exact coil and wrap it around an iron core, now, for some reason, it doesn't blow up. So what the heck's going on? We have the same exact resistance that we had over here, but now, for some reason, it doesn't blow up. Well, the reason is because of the reactance of the core. So what the heck is reactance? Well, let's answer that real quick. So reactance is part of impedance. And when we talk about impedance, the book definition says it is the total opposition to current flow. Well, the total of what? Well, it's the total of the resistance and the reactance of that circuit. And an important thing to know about reactants is that there are two types. There's capacitive reactants and inductive reactants. And this is where ferroresonance lives, right here in reactants. So in the world of reactants, we've got inductive reactants on one side and capacitive reactants on the other. And a thing to understand about reactants, these two components of it, is that inductive and capacitive reactants are exact opposites of each other. So what I mean by that is if I had an inductive circuit, say let's say that there was 10 ohms of inductive reactants on this circuit. So 10 ohms of inductive reactants. If I wanted to get rid of that, I would counter it with 10 ohms of capacitive reactants. That would bring it back to unity or like pretty much get rid of the reactants altogether on the circuit. So here is a snapshot of what's actually going on, like looking at the sine wave between these two different scenarios. In this first one, we just have a regular coil, the same exact coil that goes around the core, but here we just have it standing alone. If we look at the sine wave, all we have on the sine wave is just a source current. So it's completely unopposed. So as we run current through this coil, it's going to rise and rise and rise and rise and then hit zero and rise and rise and rise. Moral of the story being, there's nothing going to be opposing this other than the resistance of this wire itself. And being that there's only resistance, very, very minimal resistance, current flow is going to spike and this is not going to be around very long. It's going to blow up. And over here, we have the same exact coil, same exact amount of resistance, we just have it wrapped around an iron core now. So when we energize this one and current flow passes through it, we're getting the same amount of resistance, but now we have an element of reactance that is opposing that current flow as well. What that looks like on our sine wave is just like this. We've got the same source current coming in, but now because of the magnetizing of this core, essentially you're just turning it into an electromagnet. Now, the magnetic reflection or the inductive reactance of that core is going to throw out an opposing force opposing our current flow. And at every instance in time, if you're going to take like a timeline 
and I come through right here, we can see that in every instance in time, we have an opposing force to our current flow. So let's say there's my timeline, right? At this time right here, let's call this, I don't know, let's say a 100 amps or whatever. I don't know, 100 amps or 7,200 volts, however you want to look at it. We have an opposing force if this is positive, right? On the negative side, we have an opposing force at the same amount of time at the same amount. And the net of these two is going to be zero or close to it. That's why a transformer doesn't blow up when you have the coil wrapped around a core. It's being opposed by the inductive reactance of that core. So here we are. We're right back where we started, right? Same scenario. I've got three individual cutouts feeding some underground cable that is feeding the delta primary coil of an underground three-phase transformer. So we've explained where the inductive reactance comes from, where it lives, and all that. Now we have to understand where the capacitance comes from. And we know that underground cable, just because of the way that it's made, meaning the nature of its construction, turns itself into a capacitor. So a capacitor, all that is, is two or more conductors separated by a dielectric or an insulator. So if we look at a cross section of underground cable, we first got, starting from the outside in, we've got our outer jacket, then we've got a concentric neutral, that's what all the green ones are, then we've got a semicon layer, an insulation layer, the dielectric layer, We've got another small layer of, of semicon, and then we've got an inner conductor, right? Our hard current carrying conductor. So just by design here, just how they're, how they're carrying these concentrics on the outside, turns this into a capacitor. There's two conductors, two or more conductors, separated by an insulating medium or a dielectric. Now, going back to our table here, showing the relationship of inductive reactants and capacitive reactants being exact opposites, I'm hoping you guys are starting to see what's going on here with ferro. So we have an inductive load that is going to be fed by a capacitive source. We know that to keep this transformer from blowing up, we have to have some level of inductive reactance. We cannot just rely on the resistance of the coil itself. There's not enough there. So if we start off, and I'm just throwing these numbers out there just for this example's sake, let's say that this transformer coil here, the delta high side, has 10 ohms of inductive reactants that are going to keep it from blowing up. So we've got 10 ohms of inductive reactants keeping it from blowing up. I need this much reactance on here to keep that transformer from blowing up and just essentially turning into a regular old coil, right? I don't want this. I want to keep that inductive reactance. So now I'm feeding it, let's just say, long run of underground cable, right? And there's different tables out there. Um, whatever utility you guys are working for, they typically have a table that will give you the amount of capacitive reactance on this cable per foot. And there's different var variables involved, like size of wire, um, how, how big of an insulation value it has, whether it be 15 kV or higher or whatever. So it's going to give you a rating per foot, and they give you that so that you can take that number against the size of the transformer. So the KVA and the voltage, voltage rating of the transformer, it's going to have an inductive reactance value as well. And you can put, they'll show you how to use those two numbers to determine whether you're going to have a ferro situation. So we've got our 10 ohms of inductive reactance. We're going to feed it. Let's say that our capacitive re reactance value is 10 ohms as well. So 10 ohms of capacitive reactance. So when I go to energize this, I'm going to energize A phase. Follow it out with me. It's going to go down. It's going to go down. It's going to hit my delta high side on A phase bushing. It's going to go all through my delta and everything is going to come back to me hot on the bottom side of these two cutouts. The only difference is it's running through this primary coil with a capacitive source and getting rid of all of that inductive reactance. 
So these two numbers essentially cancel each other out. And now I'm right back to just having a single coil with only resistance, keeping that current from blowing it up. So as soon as I try to close this other door, this is gonna blow up. That is ferroresonance in a nutshell. It's when I have an inductive load being fed by a capacitive source. I need the inductive load to keep the transformer from blowing up, but the capacitive source takes it all away. So all I'm left with is just the resistance of that coil, which we know is not enough to keep it from blowing up. That's ferro. So now that we've explained what ferro resonance is, where it comes from, now we're gonna get down to it. We're gonna talk about how do we protect ourselves against this. So how do we protect ourselves in a ferro resonance situation? Well, the first way is to close the feed in a gang operation meaning all three phases at once close at the same exact time. So many transformers nowadays have gang switches built into the feet of these transformers. So your three elbows would go parked on your H1, 2, and 3 bushings, and from there it hits a gang switch that you can roll open or closed to energize this transformer in a gang operation. If you don't have one of those, Sometimes certain utilities will actually put a gang switch in the feed side so that you can open and close these transformers from the feed side in a gang operation. The second way you can protect yourself against ferro is to somehow increase the inductive reactance of this coil. And the way that we do that is by adding load to the secondary side at at least 15% of the rated capacity of the transformer. In doing that, you're creating a load on this transformer and the magnetic field will actually increase the amount of inductive reactance that we have. And another thing to always remember is ferro exists both when you're opening and closing these transformers. So if this was already closed in, so A, B, and C, you come up on the job, it's already hot, right? So it's already hot. A lot of guys want to come over here and dump the secondary load on this transformer, and you don't want to do that. You actually want to drop the load with the cutouts because you want to drop it with at least 15% of the rated capacity of that transformer on the secondary side over here. So the way that we would load this secondary side of this transformer is, well, if I mean, if the customer's load's on, it's on, right? But if you don't have that option, what we can use is things like heat lamps or load boxes. They actually make specialty tools for this exact scenario. So what you do is they have these little alligator clips or cheaters that you would throw on the secondary side and hit the load. A lot of times, like with a little heat lamp, there's just a button you would hit. It would heat up the heat lamp, adding secondary load to this transformer, and then you can open these three cutouts under load. So I hope this unraveled a little bit of the mystery of what's going on with ferro resonance. But guys, if you have any questions, cares, concerns, please leave them in the comments. I have my email and everything down there. Uh, like, share, subscribe, and uh, we'll see you next time, man. Keep learning. We'll see you.